let's think about what you can do rather mm. than what you can't do and we can always build on that welcome everyone to another episode here on the podcast of the heart warrior project my name is Yelis Vaas and i am your host and a fellow cardiac arrest survivor i started this project to help other survivors by talking to fellow survivors about their journey and uh, to ask them for advice and tips now my aim is to also occasionally invite health specialists on the topic of heart health to also help you live a better life as a survivor. What's more, each time a health professional is announced and uh, these announcements will be made here on the podcast, you can send in your questions beforehand. This way I can involve you even more in this project because I know, well, not only how lonely being a sudden cardiac arrest survivor can be, but also just how difficult it is, you know, to, to live with this event and... Well, if so many things change after a cardiac arrest, or at least it has for me and for many people. Now, in this episode, we invited our very first health professional, Angela Hartley, a renowned cardiac nurse and cardiac rehab expert who helps people who survived a heart attack, uh, had a heart surgery or a cardiac arrest, get their energy and life back on track. While most questions that were sent in got answered, and by the way, also thank you so much for everyone who did send in a question. Uh, some were left unasked in this episode as Angela, who understandably uh, is quite busy, did not have the time to address all of them. However, in the future, uh, we may organize a second round here on the podcast. If you want to learn more about Angela's work, check out her website, Healthy Hearties. Dot go dot uk. You can also find the website linked up in the show notes together with any other resources Angela mentions in this conversation. And the show notes are located in the description of this episode. If for some reason you can't find them there, you can also always go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Angela. With that, I do truly hope you'll find uh, much value in this conversation with cardiac rehab nurse Angela Hartley. Angela, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's uh, super exciting for me to finally talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me on. I'm excited to chat. Mostly when I start these uh, conversations, I, I start by asking you know people like, how did you survive your cardiac arrest? But I guess in this case, unless I miss something, of course, uh, I'm going to start a bit differently. So for, for people to just know a bit more about yourself, what do you do? So I am a cardiac nurse by background mm -hmm. and my main passion is helping anyone with any heart condition to live a healthier, happier, longer life. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, so I guess my main background is cardiac nursing. And then I'll, over the years, I've added exercise to that skill as well. How long have you been doing this? I qualified as a cardiac nurse in 2003, 2004. Um, and I trained in Australia. And then I came over to the UK in 2008 and I moved into uh, cardiac rehab in 2012. All right. So, gosh, it sounds like a long time, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So around, I would say, like, my latest passion, which is the exercise, would be 11 years. All right. And wait, what got you, like, interested to become a cardiac nurse and to do the work that you're doing today? So, I guess my main passion was my grandma had atrial fibrillation, and heart failure and looking back so that was about in my teenage years uh, before I was really interested in nursing wasn't sure what I wanted to do and I never felt like I could really help her you know she was constantly breathless and um, I remember um, a lot of people they're not an, anymore but they were on warfarin for it atrial fibrillation and she was on warfarin and I didn't know what it was but I remember her telling me one day my INR was 17 which if you've heard of warfarin you know is like a crazy high amount and really dangerous and I just felt so helpless Wait, what is this? to like 
Is this medication? You know, or warfarin. What? Yeah, so some people are on warfarin and it's a blood thinner. Oh, it's a blood thinner. And it's thinner. a very fine amount that you can have. It's a very specific uh -huh. level. And it should be, on average, between 2.5 and 3.5. And hers was 17. And I just remember thinking, I don't, know what, I don't know what to do. I don't even know if she needs help, what to do, how to help her. I was about 15. Um... And she was a nurse in her in her working days. And she felt really helpless, like her quality of life really deteriorated rapidly after her diagnosis. She didn't have any help, any support. Um, so when I went into university, I, I initially did business. Uh, and I found like, actually, I don't really want to work in an office Appreciate people in business don't always work in an office, but I was like, mm, this is not really for me. I did a year of natural medicine, which was a little bit like out there at the time. It's only 20 years ago, but actually at the time it was like, why are you doing that? That's crazy. Only, you know, a little bit alternative. Um, and I loved that, but it was really expensive. Um, I couldn't afford to pay the fees for it. So I did a year of that. And then I thought, do you know what? I'll do nursing. It will uh, cover all bases. Uh, I can help people. I can work all over the world. I can do some traveling. So I did that. And I did my final placement in cardiac. And I loved it. And they offered me a job straight away, straight after graduation. I worked for a few years. And then I moved to the UK, where uh, the intention was to travel for a year. So uh, I thought, <laughs> okay. What's a good job you can do when you're traveling and you can be a bit more flexible? So I became a personal trainer. And I worked in the city of London with lots of like high stressed people and built up a bit of a client base. And when I decided to stay in the UK, I went back to nursing. And then when this job came up in 2012, which was cardiac rehab, I was like, oh my gosh, I can combine personal training and nursing and help everyone. Um, and yeah, I've been doing it ever since. Wow. What made you decide to come to the UK or stay here? Uh, good question. Uh, I came with my ex-boyfriend and we wanted to travel, yeah. do a little bit of like... it's too personal, you could fun. tell me, right? No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. It's fine. A uh. um, little bit of travel. You know, we went on Ryanair every weekend to somewhere new. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And then after yeah. a year, I thought, I really want to stay. I haven't quite got rid of the travel bug um, but my ex-boyfriend wanted to go home, so we split up. He went home. And then I thought, right, this is it, my summer of fun. And I met my husband like a week later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, so we, yeah, we just hit it off. And he's English. He's very English. He doesn't want to move to Australia. And one of the like marriage contract conditions was like uh, no pressure on moving to Australia, which... Now that we've been married for 11 years, I think I could convince him, but um, I'm, not ready to, I'm not ready to go back yet, actually. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, here I am. Interesting. Well, cool. Well, all right. I mean, it's awesome what you're doing. Um, and I have a bunch of questions for you, as I already uh, said before we started recording, from listeners. Cool. Uh, so, like I also said, but just for listeners to know, I will read the questions out loud and I will paste them here for you to see them. But uh, I did make some slight not modifications to them. And again, I'm just saying, I already told you that, but I'm just saying it uh, for other listeners. So, if you are ready for a first question, I will, uh, I will right. paste it here in the chat for you. And, hold on, let me paste the name there too. So the first question is actually from Jamie Bowden, and he's the first guest that I had here on the podcast. So shout out to you, Jamie. Uh, he is also a sudden cardiac arrest survivor. So his question is, uh, my question is mainly about the fatigue after sudden cardiac arrests and the long-term effects. Has it been recorded and is it just a new normal to have moments of fatigue? And then the arrow that I added to that, that's, uh, the question that I made from it. Uh, can cardiac rehabilitation help with fatigue that so many cardiac arrest survivors experience? Do you yeah, have experience this, with that? This is a great, great question. And I, I would probably start by answering and saying, unfortunately, it is very common. And I, 
I would struggle to know a cardiac arrest survivor who didn't struggle with fatigue afterwards. Now, there is different levels of fatigue. There's different reasons for fatigue. So some of it is having to become a bit of a detective. Um, mm. A lot of it will be in those early days afterwards. The body's been through a big trauma. Yep. It's yep. recovering. There's, uh, you know, maybe long hospital stays, lack of sleep, um, drugs on board, um, yeah. things like that. Possibly some impact on the, on the brain as well with um, like oxygen, things like that. So there's a lot of reasons in the very early days that that is really, really common. Mm -hmm. Over time, so over the months afterwards, that should start to improve as will other things start to improve. Um, there are going to be speed humps, though, along the way. Like you may know that you might go forward a couple of steps, back a step, and fatigue is yeah. similar to that. Yeah. So I think getting to the bottom of, is there any reason? Is there anything obvious? So things like, are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you hydrating? What are your iron levels? Are there any other sort of major reasons for the fatigue um and then it's trying to like fill the tank up as mm. much as you can so looking into like all of those things plugging the holes in the tank so to speak with more sleep um more rest going easy on yourself those types of things um sometimes lowering expectations do you have specifics about what you just mentioned like how much sleep how much iron yeah. like how um, I think it's very difficult to give a specific, like some people don't need much sleep at all and they feel great. But I think in those early days, like I would say to anyone recovering from any big trauma like this is you're almost like a newborn baby again. You know, babies sort of sleep all the time and your body is sort of regenerating, recovering. And then gradually you're moving the naps further and further apart um, and you're having to need less naps. So, mm. you know, maybe a year later, you might still be doing an hour nap once mm -hmm. a day and you might need that forever. Or you might say, well, let's cut it down to half an hour. You know, at night, how, how are you sleeping? What's your routine like? Are you getting enough sleep? Sure. Um, and then yeah. medication comes into this as well, like side effects yeah. of medication. Beta blockers can make you very tired. Um, it's very difficult to get off of beta blockers, so it's adjusting around that. So maybe asking if you can take them at night instead of the morning or mm. um, changing the dose, splitting the dose. Um, and then filling the tank, Some there are some supplements which may help. Okay. Um, which we maybe that might come up a bit later as well, anyway, with the nutrition side of things. Um, yeah, which help with the cellular energy. You can already dive into it if you want. <laughs> uh, well, a big one is CoQ10, which you may have heard of. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm actually taking a supplement of that. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to notice that sort of immediate boost to energy. But what CoQ10 does is it helps with the cellular. It's like the battery pack of the cells. Um, and it helps with the mitochondria turnover and, and increasing the energy. It's a little bit in depth. It's like a whole hour long topic. But um, that can sometimes help. Things like B vitamins can help. Yeah. Um, obviously, before we go into that, it's more like, are you eating? Are you drinking? Are you sleeping? Are you, you know, filling the tank with the basics? Sure. Um, the These are the supplements. Levels. Yeah. B12 deficiency. So having blood tests, those types of things. Um, but yeah, I'd say, unfortunately, it is very common. Cardiac rehab can help in that it can structure exercise different to the past. So particularly if you were fit in the past and now it's like, well, gosh, how could I get back to that? I'm so tired. So with the cardiac rehab, mm -hmm. that can really make an impact on it by making it more structured to exercise. So a lot of the time people get overwhelmed by how much they can't do. And what cardiac rehab can do is t is teach you what you can do. And it's about pacing yourself. And so, you know, on month one, you might literally just get up and have a wash. And that's enough for that day. You're wiped out. Month two, you might 
walk around the kitchen, go mm. to the couch, go back to bed, month three, so on. It depends. Everyone's slightly different, obviously. Um, but when mm-hmm. you do feel ready for cardiac rehab or you get access to it, uh, which is a whole other story, um, mm, yeah. okay. they teach you how to pace yourself. Yeah. So as saying to someone today, take the pressure off, like, oh, gosh, I can't walk to the shops. Okay, well, can you walk around your kitchen? Oh, yeah, I do that all the time. Okay, well, let's make a little routine where you walk around your kitchen for three laps. Yeah, right. Can you do that? Yeah, I can try that. Okay, great. Let's do it four times. Let's do it five times. Okay, now you can maybe go to the end of the street. Okay, now let's go to the end of the block and so on and and so take away that huge gap between what Mm. you did before that takes the pressure off so cardiac rehab can definitely help you to manage fatigue and pace yourself better Mm. Uh, you were saying something about nutrition is there something more that you already want to share about that so nutrition is really such a big topic as well and i'd say in the early days it's just getting in any food any it food. doesn't have to be perfect, like mm-hmm. just eating in general, like because I, I know you lose a lot of people lose appetite. So just getting in food doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly healthy on week one. Um, and then over time, it's filling your fuel tank with the right fuel. So are you getting some good fats? Are yeah. you getting enough protein? Are you getting some good complex carbs are you filling up with a lot of rubbish fuel that only lasts a little while quick carbs you know so over time can start to introduce those habits that are you know helping to fill up the fuel tank more efficiently Mm. okay okay so uh the like so exercising can help with the fatigue Yes, and it's balancing that. So I always say I'd rather you get to the end of exercise and tell me it's too easy than right. get to the end and say, oh, gosh, I couldn't possibly do any more. I'm so knackered. I can't move for three days. I'm wiped out. So yeah. I'm like the opposite of a personal trainer. <laughs> Most <laughs> personal trainers want you to be like on the floor, sweating, gasping <laughs> for air, ready for the bucket to vomit in. Whereas I'd rather you say, oh, that was a bit easy. Brilliant. Uh, Isn't that more than you did yesterday? Great. Yeah. Let's do a bit more tomorrow. Um, yeah. And if you're having a great day, do more. And if you're having a rubbish day, do less. And it's about balancing that out and learning about, you know, spending your energy. I mean, personally, that's been a hard and I think for many cardiac arrest survivors, it's a hard thing to want to balance this out because you knew what you were able to do before. And all of a sudden, you have to learn how to cope with this kind of new person that you are. Mm. Uh, and yeah, the limitations that it has, it's, yeah, it's very frustrating. Yeah. But like you said, like being a bit kind to yourself, you've been through something very, yeah, yeah. difficult. Uh, and then it, what you yeah what you're doing helps then I guess to someone to say I like I think it's okay. empowering someone that they can do something right. and yeah. like once your body is used to that new level and it might feel ridiculously easy compared to your old self but it's yeah. building up on those steps towards your old self and you might never unfortunately get back there if you're a marathon runner you might never get back to being a marathon runner but you might get up to doing one minute jog one minute walk and that might be enough for you personally to go oh gosh I'm so happy I did like a couple of minutes running my mental health's better I can see some improvement and so it's just telling yourself yeah being kind to yourself giving yourself that hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel yeah um and I think the pacing yourself is the hard one because you're wanting to wake up and have more energy. You're wanting to go, right, tomorrow I'm going to get out there and I'm going to do more. And you might wake up and be like, oh, gosh, I can't even shower. I'm knackered. Yep. Yep. Been there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I'm going to move to a next question. And it was something that you already were talking a little bit about. And... 
I pasted the question here from he- Helena Muma. Uh, why is it that some people get uh, referred to cardiac rehab and others don't? I've had more than one cardiac arrest uh, and I've never heard of it until I joined this group. And joined this group, uh, this is from the cardiac arrest uh, group on Facebook. It's the cardiac arrest support group. Uh, so right. I made a little adjustment to it. Like, uh, what if you're interested in cardiac rehab? H- how do you start? Okay, and this is like so unfair, and I'm going to put it out there to say like the system of cardiac rehab in the UK can be mm. very unfair, and it, it's very much a postcode lottery, as as we call mm. it here for certain things. Really, it's different throughout different countries. The US is different. Each European country will be different. The world has like the same guidelines, Mm -hmm. but who has access to that is very different. So in the UK, the resources are limited. And therefore, the people who are most often referred to cardiac rehab are people who have had a bypass surgery, a valve surgery, although not always, unfortunately, um, and a, a heart attack, an MI. Um, so you might have had a cardiac arrest, but you didn't have the classic like stenting and then wow. surgery. You might have had a cardiac arrest, but it was an electrical problem. So you see like it's really complicated. Now, some places have amazing, like I spoke to a, a guy the other day, can't remember where he lived in the UK, but he was like, yeah, I, I had a cardiac arrest. It was an electrical thing. I've got an ICD and I had 12 weeks rehab brilliant amazing but then you speak to the next person they say no one called me didn't get anything no one's spoken to me since i've had a checkup in a year's time that's it um so unfortunately it's for helena it's it's not uncommon to hear that it's crazy Uh, it's really frustrating and hopefully it's changing but the resources are just so poor at the moment so, or they COVID don't have enough things. They don't have enough people to yeah. do this. Not rehab enough elite. places. There's too many people who've just had a classic heart attack uh, or bypass surgery to okay. fill it with the electrical problems, the pots, the heart failure, the uh, cardiac arrest. The other thing is that cardiac arrest is an automatic high risk category. So there's like a tick box of things. So if you If you've had a cardiac arrest, you automatically, no matter what the cause or the type or anything or the recovery, you automatically do go to high risk, which then some centers won't take high risk people, Hmm. which is then like awful because you're like, well, where does everyone go? Hmm. They go nowhere. That's terrible. Um, So there are a few things that are out there. So um, British Heart Foundation do just a really basic online cardiac rehab, which you can find on their website. Okay. There's chair-based, then there's level one, level two, level three. Um, Very basic stuff. Very similar to the NHS style, which is like, let's start by marching on the spot, keep it nice and easy, you know, make sure you're not overdoing it. You should be able to talk. So it's a little bit like of the basics. Um, But other than that, that's kind of it. Um, So then we move into like the private sector, which is uh, myself. There's another, another couple of companies out there. There's a few individuals like me um, who do the one-to-one stuff. I also do group classes. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I personalize my programs so I would be able to say, right, you're, you've had this. Let's start with the basics. Let's teach you about a warm-up, the stretches, all of those things. So, yeah, unfortunately, it is hit and miss for people, which is really unfair. You also do them online? Yes. So I have a gym here in Surrey in the UK for face-to-face. And then yeah. I can do private ones online, but most of my online stuff is Zoom sessions with like i've got about 10 to 15 people three classes a week and the the difference with the group is that community like you've built is some of that is more important than talking to me you know because i i can teach you about the heart and the medications and the risks and 
how to do it safely, but I can't be in your shoes because I yeah. haven't had a cardiac arrest. So I think that's something special to talk to other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that's one one benefit of the group bit. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Do you have maybe any exercise tips for anyone who didn't get access to cardiac rehabilitation or, or who's maybe not interested in it, but wants to do it himself or herself, you know? Because I have been, um, well, when I had my cardiac arrest, they did offer it to me, but I totally mm -hmm. forgot about it because my brain was just not working so well. Mm -hmm. And then I had an ablation uh, two months ago and they offered it again. Okay. But they didn't con they didn't contact me, so I, I I guess I might contact them. I don't know, but it's sometimes hard. Like for me, because they explained it to me, it's like three months, but you gotta be there a lot of times on a week. And for someone who's working, uh, like I don't know how to make that time. So mm. I'm kind of trying to do my own thing a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. And that's why I also just wanted to ask, like if you didn't get access or if you are maybe in a similar position like me, do you have any kind of good exercises across the broad for, for people? And it might be difficult, right? Because it might be very specific. Yeah. For everyone is different and everyone has different muscle strengths and, you know, abilities and heart function and all of that. But what I would always say is start with something small. Like I was saying about walk around the kitchen. If you can do that once... That is exercise. That is like, even though you walk, you might've just walked to the toilet that day. That is exercise. The heart rate's lifted. Your legs have done some exercise. You've had to squat down to sit on the toilet. Like you have moved. Um, so start with what you can do, which is easy and move from there. So for someone bed bound, easy might look like literally stretching your arms that day, like while you're lying down. For someone who's chair bound, you might be able to do a few punches right, and a little right. stretch, a little stretch of the arms and the legs. For someone who's walking around but not full of energy yet, you might be able to do a few calf raises while you boil the kettle. Uh, you might be able to do every time you go to the toilet. You might instead of sitting straight on the toilet, you might do three squats. <laughs> yeah, you know, like good. start really small. Yeah. Then once everything feels easy, you can add more. Yeah, so I yeah. think it gets overwhelming when you say, well, what should I do for exercise? Well, it's, you know, if you're, if you're walking for half an hour, that's exercise. Great. But if you're only managing one minute, half an hour feels so far away that it just puts you off and you think, gosh, I'm never going to do it. Um, so just start tiny, add tiny bits to it. Like if you can walk for a minute, try two minutes. 
If you can mm. walk for two minutes, try three minutes. If you can walk for half an hour, try faster. If you right. can do two squats, yeah. try four. You know, just build on it. Little bite-sized chunks. That's good. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And I like it that you got to be a little bit creative in your home, like doing a couple of squats before you sit on the toilet. <laughs> That's a good well, one. Yeah. And that <laughs> yeah. might be enough for that day. Yeah. And if you're up to doing like 10, then maybe do 10 squats and 10 calf raises um, or do it after your walk. Um, What's a calf so yeah, raise? I can give a calf raise is where you stand just with your feet flat on the ground and you lift your heels up oh, off I the see. ground and your calf muscle will oh, yeah. contract. Okay. Um, and the calf muscle is one of the biggest muscles in the body, and it's called the second heart pump. Really? And having strong calf muscles help to return fluid back up wow. and blood supply back up. So having strong calf muscles is really good. Oh, that's super interesting, actually. Okay, 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 cool. Uh, so let's move to our next question. And this is from Jasmine, and she is also um, she's also been on the podcast. So shout out to you, Jasmine. Oh, nice. uh, she's also actually the admin from a very from the uh, Facebook support group for cardiac arrest survivors. Oh, brilliant! Yeah. So okay, uh, Jasmine asked, "What should I say if I don't feel like the rehab program makes sense for my situation?" Something that speaks to the idea that not everyone has a great experience in cardiac rehab because of misunderstanding uh, their situation, like how to speak up so you do get the right care and have a good experience. And then I made, uh, is there ever a case where cardiac rehab wouldn't be helpful for someone? And what do you do if you don't feel hurt during rehab? Yeah, that's a really good point. And all of that is unfortunately very common, um, particularly amongst cardiac arrest survivors because you you are more rare than the bypassers who are wandering around the room comparing their chest wounds. Um, so yeah, you often might feel like a bit left out, a bit like you're the one, only one in the room who's had a cardiac arrest. Um, mm. You might also be a female and females are less likely to go to cardiac rehab. So you might feel like it's a bit um, male heavy. Uh, you might be young. And by young, I mean under 60. Um, so if you're <laughs> yeah, under <that's> 60, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to yeah. feel a bit odd. You're like, everyone yeah, is a true. bit older. They've had a heart attack or a mm. um, bypass and they're, you know, they're a bit older. Um, so often the, the old school cardiac rehab um, on the NHS is, is very, very much the same, tailored to the same type of person. Mm. Therefore, they don't often know how to change it for you mm. personally and also they don't have the resources so it might be one instructor one nurse 20 people and so you're like oh um this is a bit too easy for me or this is a bit too hard what should i do or my shoulder hurts what should i do and they don't really have the time to come and change it for you they'll wow. do their yeah. best and they will adapt as as they can um but you might feel a bit left out so the difficult thing is you can talk to the instructor talk to the nurse and say look I used to run is it okay to do jogging on the spot or mm. should I not do that and they might say oh just don't do it don't do it I don't have time to talk to you um, and you might then feel like oh I can't really ask questions so I think there's not really a clear cut answer because group cardiac rehab is not that geared up to making it personalized yeah yeah obviously talk to them about your concerns and just say look i don't want to drop out i can see the benefit but i'm not really finding it that helpful for my situation see if there is a way around it they might say oh sorry i um, didn't realize here's a bit of guidance if you don't like the treadmill he here's a different exercise you know they might be quite good at adapting it um yeah, voicing voicing it in a way that where you know the NHS here is super stretched, right? So they're open to feedback, but they can't always do something about it. Um, would it? Is there a case where it wouldn't be helpful? I think if it adds more stress to your life, right? So like, okay. you're you know you're having to give up your 
your job to get there. You can't yeah. afford the bus fare. It's really stressful. The room's hot. You've got to walk up like six flights of stairs to get there. By the time you get there, you're late and you're stressed. And, you know, it's probably not the, the greatest thing then. Um, I think it is beneficial for everyone, but it's just finding that that balance. And not every center has amazing staff. Not every center has amazing funding um, or access. So, yeah, and then that's, I mean, my job is based on the fact that there is terrible experiences out there, right? Like mm. people wouldn't see me if the free version was good enough. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. so that's where I'm sort of filling the gap. I tell people to do both. You know, I would never say don't do the the hospital version. Brilliant. Go to it. It's going to be the more you do, the better. Um, I'm just there to more like literally be next to you, holding your hand, which some people need more of. To make it more personal. Especially at the start. Like, gosh, it's so scary doing exercise sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And uh, so getting, I guess with... Yeah, getting through that first fear, I think, is my my number one job is to talk right. through. Right, how does this feel? What are you What are you specifically scared of? How does it feel yeah. to do that? Let's yeah. Let's make sure you're reassured that I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to make it hurt. I'm not going to make you run on a treadmill, do mm. a stress test, and then they're like, "Oh, phew! I was thinking this is going to be really hard, and I'd have another cardiac arrest." No, we. Even if we literally sit here and stretch, that's going to be good for you. Ideally, everyone should have like one on one, you know, uh, kind of coaching oh, how, with someone. How amazing this. would that be? Yeah, that w yeah. It's it, it's like a, a bit like learning a new skill, like learning to snowboard. It's better to do that one on one with an instructor than in a group. If you are more, you know, more anxious or a bit afraid, yeah. then you might learn way more. Just one on one with someone, and then maybe move to the group. But in the beginning, same, yeah. Same for everything, like any yeah. sport, any hobby. Someone's there, like looking over you, yeah. helping you. I think the group situation is great for like long term motivation, friend, friendship, support, chat. Those yep. types yep. of things is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the boat together will be the best, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's let me throw another question. Okay, here we go. From Jed Dowie. Um, what feelings can I expect from beta blockers like Sotalol when exercising, like headiness, etc.? Now, this is quite specific, uh, a specific medication, right? So I made more from it, like how does medication make it difficult for some during rehabilitation or exercise in general? And uh, do you have like any suggestions on exercising and feeling unwell from medication? Like like do you have some kind of yeah. helpful tips to cope with that for sure so i think we can be a bit specific and talk about sotalol because um a lot of people after cardiac arrest are on a beta blocker so we've got bisoprolol yeah. metoprolol sotalol um yeah i was might on, be on it for slightly different reasons but yeah. a lot of people on it are you still on it uh, no, so I'm. They, they changed my medication so many times because I was on bisoprolol and then I was also on sotalol, but they changed that quite immediately. And now I am on. Uh, it's a temporarily one. It's uh, cordarone. It's like uh, aminodarone or something. I think it's called amiodarone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's something that you can take for very long because it does yeah. a lot of damage to uh, a lot of things. Uh, yes. But it was just uh, kind of a, yeah, Helps temporary with the thing. rhythm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and they were doing the ablation, and now uh, they're going to see how... It keeps it, yeah, keeps it nice yeah. and calm. Mm -hmm. yeah, Good. Yeah. Uh, so and then they I should think, review and then... Yeah, next month I will have something else. <laughs> yeah. So I think we can talk about beta blockers because this is such a huge topic and it really does affect exercise. So first of all, what does a beta blocker do? Mm -hmm. So imagine on your heart, there's lots of receptors and they are adrenaline receptors. So we all produce adrenaline constantly, small amounts, big amounts. Um, and exercise is a situation that produces adrenaline, being scared, being excited, being happy, being sad, loads of, loads of situations. So when you're trying to do anything that causes adrenaline to be released, that adrenaline rushes to the heart and attaches to the receptor and causes increase heart rate, 
increased blood pressure in reaction. So when you take a beta blocker, it's a bit like plugging those receptors. Mm. So when that adrenaline's released, it goes to the heart, but it's not going to be received. So what happens then is there's not a, as big a response. So the heart yeah. rate doesn't rise as much. The blood pressure doesn't rise as much. It's a little bit sluggish to respond. Um, and this is a good thing, right? This is like a brilliant drug that helps to keep everything calm. It increases the time that the heart can fill, which increases the amount of oxygen available, which helps to increase the mm. heart's energy. It helps to improve the contraction. It helps to prevent arrhythmias because it slows yep. the, the um, signal down. So there's loads of really good things about it. How I describe it in terms of exercise is um, you may have seen uh, a rugby player training or a football player. And what they do is they get someone to hold on to their shirt at the back and they say, right, you try and run away from <laughs> me and I'll yeah. hold on to you. Yeah, so yeah. you're trying to do the exercise, but that person's holding you back. And that's a bit like what a beta blocker does. It's like going, you can try, but I'm not going to let yeah. you go any faster. That's a good and analogy. that's a good thing because we don't want yeah. your heart to go like maximum effort, go crazy, go like straight back to what you say in bolt level. It's mm. saying, right, I'm keeping you calm because I don't want you to go fast and I don't want you to go sprinting and I don't want you to go super hard. Um, but that will make you feel like you can't break through that sort of barrier of well I want to go back for a run and it feels like it's holding me back um so I think first of all discuss with the doctor like especially as time goes on that you sort of get left on the same dose forever and ever yeah, talk yeah. about can I reduce it at all now that it's been a few months few years yeah. um then it's about saying right okay so the beta block is keeping a lid on the heart rate mm -hmm. it will drop your maximum heart rate at maximum F exercise, so say you were allowed to run as fast as you can, it will drop your heart rate by 30 beats. So the way that that is simply just what it does and how it how it works. But say your normal maximum heart rate was is 220 minus your age. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't know how old you are. <laughs> I'm 30. I'm 30. 30. So in yeah. theory, your maximum heart rate is 190. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. In theory, if you're on a beta blocker, that drops to 160, maybe 170. Yeah. So do you see what I mean? That's such a big difference. So suddenly your exercise capacity isn't as great. Um, so when you are exercising, your heart rate's going to be lower. You need to do a longer warm-up and... Mm. And stay at a lower heart rate for much longer. Um, okay. To sort of beat the system almost. So you're like, I'm keeping it calm. I'm keeping it happy. My heart rate's much lower. Um, I always try and get people to work in an aerobic capacity, which means with oxygen, which is at a lower heart rate, which is anywhere up to 70% of your maximum. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that maximum is now much lower because of mm -hmm. the beta blocker. So to work that out, yours would be 220 minus your age, which is 30, so 190, minus 30 for the beta blocker, 160, times 70%, times 0.7, is, I can't do it off the top of my head, but say it's 130, 140. Yeah. That would be your like maximum you should go to to be working aerobically. Um, oh, okay. That's just a rough guide, yeah, rough yeah, yeah. numbers. I'm sure for each person it's different because you might find at 130, you're like really breaking a sweat. You're like, oh, it's too hard. Um, but it's sort of a rough guide of how we work it out. Okay. And is there something that you can do when you feel restrained by the medication? Like, is there something... That could help. No, you shouldn't be trying to like break through that uh -huh. restrained feeling. It's trying to exercise at that lower level. Yeah, okay. Eventually, you'll get fitter at that le lower level. Oh, yeah. So you'll be able to do more at that lower level. Right. Yeah, so that's yeah. the adaptation of the stronger muscles and, and okay. all of that. So, okay. yeah, I think it's quite a complex one. But in general, beta blockers lower everything. They make you feel a bit sluggish. 
Um, but that's their job. So there's not really a huge amount you can do around it other than go a bit slower, go a bit longer. Mm. Eventually, you'll be get faster at that lower heart rate. Is there any other medication that makes it difficult to exercise, like blood uh, pressure uh, lowers? Like I'm taking uh, Ramipril. I don't know if you yeah, it lowers I think, your blood pressure. Yeah, they don't tend to lower your heart rate as much. Mm, yeah, um, no. But you, if you do find you get a bit of low blood pressure, then mm -hmm. it can cause a bit of an issue. Yeah. So that's then more looking, keeping an eye on it, not going from sitting to standing or lying to standing too quickly. Yep. Um, warming up properly, not overdoing it, all of those things. And if you do feel dizzy, obviously maybe going a bit lower intensity. Yeah. Don't don't sort of overdo it. Hydration. Yeah, that's a huge one too, especially now with the warm weather here. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the time because I know that you have to kind of go soon. And I'm looking at my questions. You know, let me ask just the last question to you. So this is from uh, Karen Conroy Oaks. Uh, I would like to know when cardiac rehab is finished. Uh, how do you know if or when is it safe to increase exercise and activity? Is there any tip of programs to have follow up? I enjoy the program. Uh, just feel a little lost after being discharged. And uh, then I added, when are you done with cardiac rehabilitation? What determines that you're done and what do you do after that? Yeah, this is great. I'm so glad that you really uh, enjoyed the program, Karen. And it's great that you had access as well. So what we have in the UK, and I'm assuming it would be similar in other countries, is four stages of cardiac rehab. So stage mm. one is in the hospital immediately after. That might be the physio getting you out of bed uh, mm -hmm. you know, walking down the corridor. Stage two is when you're sort of immediately at home, like having a shower by yourself, maybe walking around the house, um, sort of getting your confidence back. Stage three is the one that Karen's been to, which is in the hospital. It's very structured. It's in the group. Um, they do education. And then after that, in theory, there's stage four, which is mm. some people go to it forever. Like 20 years later, they're still there, the same people. Um, okay. Stage four is community cardiac rehab. So community cardiac rehab is run by an instructor like me in like the village hall or in a school or in a like, you know, gym. And you turn up and it's similar to phase three in the hospital base, but there's no nurse. Ah, there's yeah. no there's no sort of hospital on site. They don't check your medication at the start, but it's a safe exercise program, which you know, you're surrounded by other heart people, right? So they're never going to make you do a thousand burpees and push you that hard. Um, so that would be the best thing. Now you can just Google phase four cardiac rehab and your area, see what comes up. Um, but yeah, again, it might be not available in your area. It might be no instructors in your area. Mm. Um, the hospital in theory should refer you on. So you could go back and ask them and say, right, I've finished, what do I do now? Okay, there is yeah. something in the UK called exercise referral, which is basically anyone with a health condition, um, and it's run by our local councils. Again, hit and miss, not everyone gets access. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, so that would be the next sort of step. In theory, when are you done? Do you have a heart condition forever? Uh, possibly. So you could stay at that phase four forever. I'd say you're ready to move on when you'll know it. You'll be like, God, I've been doing this class. It's so easy. I mean, it's ridiculous. I've been doing it for, you know, six months. It's too easy for me now. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, go yeah. off on my own. I'm going to push it a tiny bit more. Yeah. Um, and you're never going to go from that, like, super supervised class out to a marathon. It's always like the next step up is just a tiny bit more. Yeah. a tiny bit more um yeah in theory phase four can be as long as you want it to be yeah i guess there's also not a finish right because in a way you got to keep exercising uh, once you're done too ideally i guess yeah and it's finding out your parameters so 
um, going back to the doctor after a year, they might say, right, let's reduce the beta blocker, which will help you to do mm. slightly more, or let's um, redo the echo, your heart functions up, which will allow you to do more. So there might be things that change over time where they say, okay, you're allowed to push it a little bit more now. You, know, you might have your pacemaker check and they say you've had absolutely no rhythm issues. We're happy for you to go to 130 beats per minute. You know, they sort of give you slight guidance sometimes. All right. Um, you shared so many incredible and wonderful things that have been helpful for me and I'm sure for many listening. Uh, there were some other questions, but maybe at some point we can do another round in the future. Sure. Uh, and people can uh, send in a couple more questions. Uh, let's maybe end by just, is there something, I know I know there's so much, but is there something that you still just want to share if something pops up? Or do you feel like we covered quite some some good things already for now? So many things. But I think the takeaway <laughs> message that I always want to give people is that there's that huge capability of the heart to do a lot when you are when you've had that setback, like the heart can sometimes improve, the heart function can improve. Um, it's, it's working with your parameters that you've been given and almost cheating the system. Like if you've got poor heart function, it's saying, okay, well, what can I, what can I do with that? Can I still do some seated exercise? That will help my mental health. When my mental health's better, I feel like doing my exercise. When my exercise is good, my mental health's good. You know, all yeah. of that. So I think it's maybe the takeaway is let's think about what you can do rather mm. than what you can't do. And we can always build on that. Yeah, yeah. Very true, yeah. A lesson that I still have to remind myself on too. So thanks for, for, for reminding me. Uh, Angela, thank you so much for doing this, for taking the time and uh, for uh, yeah, answering these questions. You're very welcome. And that concludes my conversation with cardiac rehab nurse Angela Hartley. I hope you found this episode valuable and that you did get some takeaways from it. Now, to find any resources that Angela mentioned, do take a look at the show notes that are located in the description of this episode or by going directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and searching for Angela. There, you can, by the way, also find ways to connect with Angela. Having said that, maybe I get to welcome you again on another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. This is Yelis Vaas signing off. Before you go, I uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project, which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.